Thanks, Kitty. Um, so the Paminda is already presented, so we will begin with the silent prayer, if you'll kneel with me. Amen. Yesterday we discussed the history we are in. that we are in the history of the formalisation of the message of the Sunday Law. Nineteen eighty nine to the Sunday Law. We understand that 2019 was the increase of knowledge. And it centered the message on gender. Here. Bringing us to here. We're now in the history of the formalization. So what we understood in very much childlike terms in 2019, we need, now need to consider with a deeper maturity. prophetic maturity. And it's not like there's the increase of knowledge and the formalization. And nothing in between. The journey from the increase of knowledge to the formalization. with the apis ball, with false freedom, with understanding LGBT, has all been part of that journey that brings us from the increase of knowledge to the formalization. But what was understood from a great distance in 2019, we need to understand more and more closely. And as we get closer and closer to these issues, What in 2018 and 2019 was two streams of information now we're finding that while we have discarded entirely the false stream of information the true stream gives us problems
We need to divide truth from error in the right stream. We need to see compromise in what we have in the past described as the right stream. It becomes, it becomes more and more difficult to find articles to share on some topics. There was a really neat article that discussed uh, the North American Indigenous community. Respectfully defended their culture. Explained how in their culture they did not have an understanding or acceptance of LGBT. It was written by an African American woman. defending their culture against misappropriation of any form. Right stream of information. But because she doesn't want to, because she wants to frame their culture in the best light possible, Whilst, while she's explaining that they did not have an understanding or acceptance of trans individuals, she says, makes the following sentence. They, the North American Indians, could not just change gender at will. So I'll phrase it exactly. At a whim. It's like saying flippantly. They couldn't wake up one morning and think, I think I'll change gender today. So in defending one minority community again, it's based on race. She casts the issue based on gender in an incorrect light. And while that article had good technical information about how their culture operated, how it gets misappropriated, you still see these serious errors Now, if we want to understand mass global politics, it's fairly easy to sort through that true stream of information. You get into anything related to gender. It's a lot like religion. It 
It doesn't matter how qualified they are. It doesn't matter if they're on the Supreme Court. Without careful methodology, their own experiences, their own prejudice, their own preferences, mould what they believe and what they write. Some people have asked a question I thought I would answer now. Uh, some months ago, we taught about the gender of God. That God is not this biological male. God is not gendered, God is not male. And some people have noticed that I don't often or at all use the term father for him. People are wondering whether it's inappropriate to use male pronouns or the word father. the dispensation that we now live in as we deconstruct this this 6,000 year issue of gender. I'm not here to tell people what they need to say, how they need to refer to God. But if they have noticed me making deliberate efforts to not use male terms, that is, that is accurate. What I'm trying to get in is into your subconscious. So I'm sorry if you find that creepy. Disturbing. I'm trying to get into your subconscious where subconsciously you picture and relate to God. Every, every time a Pharisee knelt to pray, he's picturing the apis bull. And every time an Adventist kneels to pray, they are picturing a masculine God. And when I start a prayer by saying, dear father, even if you think you don't notice, it's already in your brain. So yes, I am attempting to undo that. The reason I don't start a prayer with dear mother is however much I would like to rub people the wrong way, 
make people uncomfortable. Deliberately uncomfortable. Because comfortable people never change. My issue is that in using female, I know that most people in the movement subconsciously go to here. And all of a sudden, God is pretty. God is gentle. God doesn't make you uncomfortable. God is a woman. Not a judge. Not a general. And I don't want people going here when they think female. So it's deconstructing two things. Deconstructing that apostle masculinity idea of God. Also deconstructing the idea of the feminine. Because when Pope Francis prays to Mary, it's all about that female essence. And when we can Pray to God and picture a female general. We know that we're deconstructing those layers of ingrained stereotypes. So, male terms like father. Reinforce exactly what we are trying to undo. Female terms are also inaccurate. God is not a woman. But they are helpful to undo the picture you have of God. As long as you don't revert and my third and final issue is the minute I refer to God as female people will forget everything else I just said. If for God I say she did this, I think most people are no longer listening to any other words in that sentence. And it becomes a distraction if I'm trying to make a point. So that might not leave you with a final answer. But those are the three difficulties I think that we are facing and trying to navigate. It's more important that we deconstruct the idea of what is female
To me, that's more important than referring to God as female or male. Because unless we undo the stereotypes, we won't relate to God correctly. Yesterday we spoke about the history of 1989 to 91. There are three key events that relate to gender. We could include the events that were the start of the gay marriage movement. But I'm not looking now to go into that thread. These are the three events we spoke of yesterday. 1989, intersectionalism. Understanding the layers of prejudice that exist for women when they aren't just female. They can be a woman, but a woman of colour. A woman, but trans. A woman, but Muslim. A woman, but lesbian. A woman, but with a disability. A woman, but an immigrant. A woman but Hispanic or Chinese or Jewish. Keep this is a diversion, and I'll just mention it now. We're diverting for, for two seconds. The Alpha History of Adventism is racism towards the African American community, slavery. What is the Alpha History of the Counterfeit? Racism towards the Jewish community. Alpha history racism, alpha history racism. Which should make Walter Weiss comments on the Jewish deep state that much worse. In so many ways, he's frankly Catholic. But when you look at slavery and you look at the Holocaust, you are looking at the alpha histories of modern Israel and modern Babylon. And you're seeing how both responded to that subject. So when we consider them today, it also includes these communities. Something that Adventism, especially especially in the stream of, of Walter Weiss gets um, terribly wrong. So 
1989 intersectionalism. Nineteen eighty nine Price Waterhouse versus Hopkins. She was told that all her problems would be solved. Her career problems. If she walked more femininely. wore makeup, styled her hair better, and wore jewelry. 1989, time of the end. It's, all, it's always in the 1989 to 1991 history that you see that internal seed of what you're going to be fighting 30 years later. Nineteen ninety one Clarence Thomas versus Anita Hill. Clarence Thomas is the second African American nominee to the Supreme Court. And Anita Hill accuses him of sexual harassment. This has gained a lot of attention in the last couple of years. Because of the Trump administration. And his nominating a man with also a history of sexual abuse. I forget his name. In both cases, the testimony of the woman was ridiculed and ignored. One of the reasons, ways that Clarence Thomas was defended was that because he was African American, The testimony of Anita Hill was a political and racist attack. Any attack on him was therefore racist. And because of that, the testimony of an African American woman was ridiculed and discredited. We face the same issue today. When arguments of racism are used to defend those who abuse or are sexist and are sexist. When people don't get that the test is gender, and not held back by any national or cultural lines, I didn't intend to go here, to go in this direction. Not so much targeting the African American community, and the myriad ways that sexism has been defended since two thousand and nineteen. 
I want to target liberal mainstream. But I'm going to use a couple of recent scandals. When Donald Trump was running for election, in one of those debates with Hillary Clinton, the moderator was a Fox News host. Woman, Megan Kelly. Now, I just want to give you a couple of statistics before we start. One in five women during their lifetime face, one in five face completed rape or attempted rape. One in three face physical domestic abuse. In, in some countries, it's 50% of women in that country manage domestic abuse. In a report released earlier this year, by the United Nations. One in three women globally that's 736 million women are subjected to physical or sexual violence. They describe it as the pandemic for which there is no vaccine. And if you think the world is getting better, it is not. It's been 10 years without improvement. Over 40% of African-American women are physically abused by a partner or former partner. In their lifetime. Over 50% report psychological abuse. And coercive control. A woman in the United States is shot by a partner or former partner. Every 16 hours. That's just gun death. That's just guns. That's not strangulation, beating, stabbing. That's not all the years that leads to that kind of murder. That's not all of the sense of ownership and control that often causes that rate of murder. So one statistic for one weapon.
only in the context of abuse related directly to their gender. It's every 16 hours. When statistics reach such a height as we talk about 736 million, people tune out. If we were to talk about 736 million of any other community, if we were to talk about a Jewish person every 16 hours, society is numb to not just the effects of sexism, but also to the foundational ideas of ownership and control that cause that sexism. People are numb to the scale, they no longer care. And this isn't to make us emotional. It's in a prophetic sense. Donald Trump, Megyn Kelly. He expects special treatment. It's Fox News. They'll go easy on him. He says she gets out and she starts asking me all sorts of ridiculous questions. She was hard on him and he didn't expect that. You could see there was blood coming out of her eyes, blood coming out of her wherever. In my opinion, she was off base. And the whole world erupts. Because where did where did he know where to, how did he know where to go? He didn't go for her mind. He sunk beneath even going for her appearance. He sunk beneath even going for her personality. He brought, brings up her vagina and menstruation. He was angry and he knew where to aim. The left knew how to react. Much of the center knew how to react. They knew the appropriate response. Any, many right-wing people knew the appropriate response to what he said. And they were horrified and disgusted. In the past, I've brought up John Stewart.
In the past, I've brought up John Stewart. Liberal hero. He has someone who has been very much a colleague to him. Dave Chappelle. After the death of George Floyd, Dave Chappelle is a comedian, by the way, but a very political one. By many, he's considered to be the greatest comedian of all time. He's viewed in, in a light above all others. He's a hero to many. In 2020, after the death of George Floyd, he released a comedy special. It wasn't all meant to be funny, it was social commentary. It was called 846. After the amount of time that a policeman knelt on the neck of George Floyd. And Dave Chappelle is an African-American man. Wanted to address the subject of racism in the United States. Now there is a extremely conservative right wing woman in the United States. Candace Owens. Now I'm going to quote as best I can what Dave Chappelle said and the translators will need to manage. I will have to substitute some of the most offensive words. Candace Owen, that rotten bitch. Remember, that is the female version of the N word. That a man just said. She's the worst. I can't think of a worse way to make money. She's the most articulate idiot I've ever heard in my, swear word, life. Referencing Floyd's past, he stated, I don't give a swear word what this N-word did, George Floyd. I don't care if he personally kicked Candace Owens in her stinking vagina. I don't know if it stinks, but I imagine it does. If I ever find out, I'll let you know. Candace Owens is a woman of color. So regardless of the fact she's a conservative, I 
I don't like what Megan Kelly says either. We don't agree with Megan Kelly. We don't care with Ke agree with Candace Owens. But when Donald Trump is angry, where does he aim? The same place that women find aimed, the one in five women who face rape. Where did Dave Chappelle know how to aim? Same place. Donald Trump goes after the fact that it bleeds there. Dave Chappelle goes after the idea that it smells there. Because these aren't women who just offend them. And they go after their mind. When these men attack, they go after the ugliest stereotypes of what is female. If you did that to any community that even was facing the level of discrimination and abuse that women are, if you found such a community, people would be horrified. Donald Trump, the left is horrified. Dave Chappelle went so much further than Donald Trump. Almost half of African women, African American women in the United States face domestic abuse. In 2020, for all reasons, four African American women were being murdered every single day. And Dave Chappelle doesn't just say she bleeds. He says she stinks. And then he says he doesn't care if a man was to kick her, physically abuse her, between the legs. People were horrified at Donald Trump. Dave Chappelle was lauded as the greatest comedian of all time. And this show alone was nominated for three Emmy Awards. What I find fascinating is Candace Owens' response. Because we should see how horrifically sexist not just Dave Chappelle is, but society is it that la is that laughed and tolerated.
It's a window into the mainstream mindset of mainstream and liberal society. But Candace Owens' response to every Democrat tweeting me the clip of Dave Chappelle insulting me. I'm not a leftist, I have a sense of humour, and I think comedians should make fun of people. Dave Chappelle is one of the greatest comedians of all time, and I made it into one of his specials. That's power. We've arrived too suddenly into a culture where people can't laugh at themselves or want to restrain comedians. I will never be part of that culture. Dave Chappelle, you are legend, and I'd love to meet you and challenge you to say that any of that to my face. All love. Soon after Donald Trump's soon after Donald Trump's offensive words, Megan Kelly was fawning after him. Candace Owens isn't offen offended by Dave Chappelle. Why isn't she offended? Because she's sexist. She's already embraced that mindset. All she's hearing is her own thoughts echoed. own mindset and behaviour echo. The sexism, and I mean that in the ugliest sense of the far right, echoed. By the left. By the liberals. So there's nothing in there for her to be offended. Dave Chappelle also addressed Laura Ingram. In the same context, he said, again, Forgive my language, but I want people to get how offensive it is. She's a regular white bitch with a platform. I think the most offensive word in that phrase is regular. Because the insult he's designing to sting is that she is standard. So it's not just, he's not just targeting her. When he says regular, he says one of many. This is just what they are. And he includes the word white, but Candace Owens wasn't.
that's a dis that's a distraction. His attack is that they're female. He then labelled her what is considered the most offensive swear word in the English language. All letter word starts with a C. And it stands or originates from a word for the female vagina. Merriam Webster states that it is a usually disparaging and obscene term for a woman and that it is an offensive way to refer to a woman in the United States. In American slang, the term can also be used to refer to a fellow male homosexual that one dislikes. So that just references us back to the Sacramento camp meeting. When we see how those at the Sacramento camp meeting, we saw how sexism is used as an, it is used as a tax on homosexual men. Australian scholar Emma Alice Jane describes how the term as used on modern social media is an example of what she calls gendered vitriol and an example of misogynistic bile. We could just say that there's double standards. Donald Trump says a woman is bleeding when she offends him. Dave Chappelle says they're female dogs. Regular like all the others. The most offensive word in the English language, other than the N word. That is especially kept for women as it means the vagina. And endorsed physical violence towards the vagina. and is awarded, is nominated for the three Emmy Awards. After that special, in the context of COVID, in the context of George Floyd, he reached a cult hero status like no one else at the time. And only now in the last month, where his transphobia and homophobia is starting to come through, Is the mainstream left starting to wince? I wanted us to consider not the African American community, but 
just mainstream society. I can keep throwing out statistics all day. That are only addressing the very top of the iceberg. Of what women in every nation, every culture, every society face. I can spend day after day from thousands of miles away trying to hold the hands of women in this movement who were raped in the same orifice that Dave Chappelle so flippantly refers to. Many women listening now who watch these videos who relieve, relive what they have been through and what they are going through now every time we teach these subjects. So if this subject makes you uncomfortable, because we're not speaking about racism enough, or you're male, I don't, don't care. We have to see the extent of sexism. Unless we address the extent, if we can't do that now in this context, do you really think that you will do it in heaven? There isn't more information that God can give you in heaven. When you're living through it now. Radical ve feminism versus liberal feminism. There's two main attacks that have been made against women who call for change. There's like, like Donald Trump and Dave Chappelle. Those in opposition to equality know where to hit. One is physical appearance. What society considers attractive. The other is personality. What every woman hears at some stage in her life. Don't you have a sense of humour? 
when faced with sexism, they expect a woman to laugh, to not make the situation uncomfortable. This was an issue in 1970 at the World Pageant. When the male comedian refers to women as cows waiting to be valued. And however uncomfortable all the women in that audience would have been expected to laugh, And if you don't find it funny, you don't have a sense of humour. They attack the physical appearance, then they go for the personality. Candace Owens responds to Dave Chappelle. I'm not one of those women who don't have a sense of humour. So I'm okay with what he said. Radical feminism is radical because instead of laughing, they see the underlying horror. They know the science, the data. And they don't treat those numbers as meaningless statistics. Going back to, for the translators, the original document of quotes. Radical feminism is a perspective within feminism that calls for a radical reordering of society in which male supremacy is eliminated in all social and economic contexts while recognising that women's experiences are also affected by other social divisions such as race, class and sexual orientation. It includes the social because the personal is political. Liberal, also known as mainstream feminism, is the main branch of feminism. It defines its focus on achieving gender equality through political and legal reform within the framework of liberal democracy. Liberal feminism works within the structure of mainstream society to integrate women into that structure. So they don't intend to rock the boat too much. They don't intend to make any great changes to structure. They don't intend to impact the social decisions of women and men.
their focus is on quotas. And part of the difficulty we have had with organisation is sometimes in ministries, quotas aren't enough. When they put a woman in, in a position of authority, and then the men operate like a shadow government. How many women in this movement have been put in positions of authority? And then people have given me the wrong names for them. Spelt their names wrong. Informed them of decisions after the fact. And the men continue to speak for the ministry. And in ex extremely stubborn ministries, this liberal feminism idea of just get 50-50 in positions of authority which often is enough to upset people. Hasn't been enough. Because of how those women have been attract, attacked and treated. Or frankly ignored. And in those ministries, we step in and do more than quotas, we dismantle. And that upsets people. And I see it as conservative control. It's not conservative in its principles. I think this would be a good place to end. So we're going to go further into the issues with liberal feminism. What I wished to discuss in this presentation when showing the mindset and response to Donald Trump And comparing that to the response of Dave Chappelle, breaking down how much more offensive his words than Trump's words were, trying to again get into your subconscious. Where in the last dispensation, he said racism and sexism, both the issues. We understand sexism now, we've been learning it for six months. A 30, 40, 50, 60 years of ingrained sexism has gone. And you know what? Mainstream liberal society has it all figured out.
Thou stand up for the rights of women. And then members in this movement, women in this movement, chasing after liberal mainstream ideas of feminism. And between 2019 to now, it has destroyed lives. It has cost people their salvation. And it will continue to. But in a prophetic sense, in the context still of the light of the Apis Paul, we need to much more closely break down feminism and agenda. and work on that 6,000 years of societal indoctrination. We'll close in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for how you have led. We see all the steps that have brought us here. We see how you have led us. We pray, Lord, that we will have confidence. Not an emotional feeling. more like a prophetic anchor. That you have and will guide us home. May we see that home for what it is. and desire to shed our worldliness to attain it. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.